Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. It is the last episode of, of 2018 for us. So we're going to be looking back. Isn't that right, Dan? This is correct. We are doing our top five, not dead or alive, but our top five moments of 2019. No, 2018. Yes. <laughs> You're already looking ahead to the future, but we are going to look back at the year. And uh, uh, we both have a top five list that we're going to get into. And we have also other cool things that we're going to look back at the year that was, including a really epic bike packing trip by... Yeah, this, if you weren't uh, following along, Robert and... Two friends. Two friends went from Calgary to Port Renfrew which is on the west coast of the west coast on Vancouver Island. And this was a, it was a cool trip because it was, it was his way of like doing a, a, a tune-up before the world in Innsbruck. And so he just thought he'd go for a big bike ride. You know, That's as a somebody who has stuck to panniers this whole time, Matthew. That's me. I stick with panniers. Yeah. Are you upset that he went bikepacking and not touring? Uh, you know, uh, he did load up pretty good, though. He wasn't. He wasn't. He was loaded. He was. He was loaded. So you know, I will give him. I'll give him that. But uh, yeah, it'll always just be touring to me. But that's a debate for another day. Um, another cool ride we have featured is uh, contributor Melanie Chambers got a last-minute invite to the uh, Taiwan KOM Challenge, which she did in October, and we're going to hear the story of that. And also, from, uh, from following her blog, it looked like uh, she had most of her training in Toronto here. <laughs> There's some Toronto. I think she went. She went out east for a bit. Listeners might be shocked to know, not a ton of alpine meters in Toronto. No, no, it's really hard to clock in more than a thousand meters within the city limits in one ride. But there you go. That was a big challenge. Um, and also, we are going to have a segment that we're going to, I think, continue in the new year, called. Ask a coach, and our coach is Peter Glassford, frequent contributor to the magazine. So let's get on with the show. Philippe Tremblay, web editor, welcome. How's it going, Matt? <laughs> it's going well. Um, earlier this year, you spoke with Rob Britton. He's a um, pro cyclist on Rally Pro Cycling, and he's He's also a very good climber from Regina, from one of the flattest parts of the country. But what was the occasion for your chat with Rob? So before the World Championships, Rob Britton rode from Calgary all the way to Port Renfrew um, with a couple of friends and his bike fully loaded. It was not a conventional training camp by any means. Um, It was an idea that had come to him during the summer and he... Uh, got some advice from a pretty knowledgeable fellow, um, Svein Taft, who uh, started cycling in part just to get out into the, the wilderness. And uh, now it's becoming something that's pretty in, in vogue in pro cycling. You've got guys in Europe doing trips. Yeah, yeah. It's It seems very much the story of, of 2018, like from the no-go tour uh, that was uh, Connor Dunn and Larry Warbass just going out and doing some big... Uh, I guess bike packing, but they they weren't as loaded as as Rob and his two friends, if I understand correctly. No, they they did it right out. Uh, you know, they were riding over the Rockies. There aren't a lot of towns out there. They did have tents. They didn't use them every night. Some nights they decided maybe a hotel room would be a little bit more comfortable. But they were on some back roads, and it took them nine days. They were by no means going fast. It was a, a long uh, nine day grind and the training that he got from that seems to have paid off because he rode for about 200 kilometers in the breakaway at Worlds, which not only was a great ride for him personally, but for Team Canada, it meant that they could relax and leave Mike Woods just chilling out in the in the pack. Yeah, it set up, it set up Mike Woods quite well. So you spoke to, to Rob Britton and then you also spoke to Swain Tuft and um I believe uh, Mr. Tuft was at home when you spoke with him. So he's been a busy guy since the end of his season, and he was back home in BC, and he was finally back in Andorra, where he lives full-time with his young family. And uh, it was a busy busy day in there. His uh, young son, Gunner, was a little active in the background there. He also has a dog who chimed in a bit while, he, uh, while Spain was giving me some uh, really interesting uh, background on his history of, of packing um, and going off on his bike and, uh, and the increasingly growing trend of doing that as a mode to, uh, 
freshen things up as a professional cyclist. Right on. Well, let's hear from Rob Britton, Swain Tuft, and some of Swain Tuft's family. I'm Rob Britton. I race professionally for Rally Cycling, and I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Like, normally that would have been something I just sort of made fun of. I'm like, these guys are like idiots. Like, why would you do that? But, you know, it was, I just kind of like woke up and like, I started like seeing this like backcountry stuff. And like, I've always loved riding my cross bike on mountain bike trails and taking on dirt roads and not road riding, like if the opportunity like presents itself. Hi, my name is uh, Swain Tuft. I ride with uh, Mitchelton Scott World Tour team. Um, yeah, I live in Andorra and uh been in europe now for geez quite some time so 20 years ago i was doing that stuff and you know initially it was um i was really into mountain climbing and uh it was a means of traveling how i even got into biking was just to get out to the mountains and so i could do these climbs and cars at the time for you know the jobs that i had i was just working odd jobs it was just too expensive for insurance and gas and all that stuff. So, you know, I, I got into cycling in, in, in a very different way. And, um, it, uh, it really, uh, <laughs> you know, doing those trips, it really caught my, uh, I don't know, I got, I became really passionate just about cycling in general. Um, and so it, it changed me from going into the mountains to now I just wanted to travel and live on the bike. And so I did that for, quite a few years, three to four years, um, uh, two times up to Alaska, down to Mexico, and uh, yeah, a lot of trips within BC and, and the Rockies and uh, the Sierra Nevadas. So, uh, you know, it was, it was very different at that time because I had a big aluminum trailer and a crappy mountain bike, and I had my dog always with me. So, you know, I wasn't uh, doing the high speed tours that that I'm capable of now, but uh, it's it was the same idea and the same love that I that I had. And uh, it, it's funny now to be coming full circle 20 years later, getting to enjoy that same thing that uh, I fell in love with cycling to start with. So, yeah, it's been a it's been a funny journey. Originally, it's Calgary to uh, Victoria, but then I have my own gravel event out in Port Renfrew, so that'd be kind of cool to tie that in. So Worlds never had anything to do with it. It was just like, all right, let's let's do this. And thankfully I have some really amazing friends who are like, Yeah, that let's do it. Like we'll we'll make it happen. All we have to do is, you know, figure out how and what bikepacking is and we'll we'll do that. So it would kind of like I put this rough plan of a road together and just decided this could be something really cool and something I kinda of needed to do that it wasn't you know, TSS, you know, rated, like not look at my power meter for 10 days of like, biking, which I can't even remember the last time I did that during the season was. The training for cycling has become so specific that you're almost like a robot some days. And I, you know, I think there's parts of you, like, you know, in the, the very highest level, there's, there's parts of us that need to do that work. But I also think it's just not sustainable. And, uh, <clears throat> When you get when you get the taste for the freedom on the road when you're when you go touring, it just opens your your whole horizon to what's the possibilities and uh, yeah, it just changes your perspective on training because you also realize you get you get a massive workload. You're, you're ticking off all the boxes, yet you're enjoying your <laughs> you're enjoying yourself so much more than just going up and doing uh, five minute intervals on some climb and then. Uh, groveling home physically i did a lot of prep before the bike packing it wasn't like the bike packing came out of the blue and that was what uh built me up for the worlds entirely um i think it was just this massive block of um volume and i've always responded well to vault like you know medium intensity but like really high volume so we just kind of went with that it was definitely a roll of the dice but at the end of the day it worked out really well. And, you know, looking at Innsbruck, it was going to be this just beast of a day, you know, 270K or something, like, like 4,000 meters of climb. I can't remember all the metrics now, but it was just this huge day. And 
So I was like, well, might as well just do a bunch of huge days. So I think our average ride time for those nine days was like eight and a half hours or something. Like every day average, some days were like 12 hours of pedaling. Some days were, you know, seven hours. So yeah, it was, uh, it seemed kind of like, no, not a bad idea at the time, but for sure up until, uh, you know, us in the break on the day, I had no idea what to expect. A lot of things have, uh, have changed in the, with the technology of bike packing, and, um, it makes it really easy to get out there and enjoy, you know, massive, massive K's, big days on the bike. Anytime you speak with Spain, it's just sort of like, you feel like you have the opportunity to speak with a legend. So you kind of like anything he says kind of has that effect, but, uh, you know, uh, I just kind of like, cause the idea came to me like literally like the day before the time trial. So I'm like, and I know in Swain to, to have done a bit of this stuff. So I just kind of go over waiting for the podium. I'm like, Hey, uh, so you've done this bike packing thing. What do you, what, what should I do here? Like, I didn't know what bags to get or, you know, how many days to start off or anything like this. I just sort of was rolling with it. Um, which I think he's a kind of guy who would appreciate that too. And he kind of just told me that he's like, oh, I like all the gear is good now. Um, you have a blast. I mean, he's a great example of, of like how like a workload like that can, can really pay off. And, you know, from, from what I understand, they had a really, really great trip and covered some awesome. I mean, I was pretty jealous when I was uh, hearing the route going through the Kootenays. That's, that's some of my favorite, uh, parts of the world i do like doing different things on my bike I, and i do love going off the beaten track anybody who's ever ridden with me before for better or worse knows that's very true i like to yeah just not ride down the same road as everyone else um even if it ends up breaking both my wheels and i have to get picked up on the side of the road which has definitely happened jamie um the guy who did uh the whole thing with me who's like he used to race professionally as well over in the uk and we've been friends forever. Um, they'll tell you the same thing. We both had this sort of like anxious nervousness because um, we both left from different parts of Calgary. He's in the very far south. I'm kind of in the middle of downtown. So we had this two hours or so of riding by ourselves with all our gear on. And you're not really like hauling ass. You're just sort of like creeping along. Bike right, waste a ton. And neither of us had done this before. Like I did one practice ride. But other than that, like, this was it. Like, we were rolling out and we weren't coming back. Like, this would be one of the few times, well, the only time really I left Calgary and, like, wasn't riding back home at the end of the day. And I was like, all right, so I'm going to do this bikepacking thing from here to here. Could you give me, like, a top five of stuff so that I don't die? You know, some of the things that are that are really important is just be ready for what, like, the craziest weather situation you can because a lot of times we look at the – the weather forecast five or six days out and, and it looks good. Um, but you know, when you're in the mountains or you're in different areas, things can turn, turn South pretty quick. And, uh, <clears throat> I think it's really important to just have the, have your clothing really sussed out and, uh, ready, ready for anything because boy, if you have to go two, three hours when the temperature drops and you get a ton of rain that can make for a pretty, pretty rough tour. I think it was the day after we went through um, the first major pass, like which was day one. So we went over a pass. It was at 7,000 feet, I think, something like that. And the day after, it snowed. So if that would have happened, it would have been like done right then. Like We couldn't have ridden through. We weren't going to walk. Well, we probably tried to walk because we're stupid. But um, yeah, that would have been bad. But we dodged that by a day. Um, we'd always just get hit. Like The first couple of days, we'd just get hit by just a bit of rain. But it was usually at, like it wasn't that cold, so that was fine. Like no worries. Uh, we almost got in trouble in uh, Cranbrook. One, all but one hotel were uh, completely full for the uh, BC Senior Games. So that was that could have been bad. That was like a twelve-hour day, and we finished at like ten thirty at night. So and we were soaking wet and cold and shattered. So we didn't really want to have to set up a tent in the parking lot. The last day, I guess, was probably the closest like to crazy we had 
riding the uh, Sea to Sky Highway towards Vancouver at eight in the morning. That's that's like rush hour on a road that has a bunch of twists, and like you just feel like eventually someone's going to be texting, and that's going to be it for you. So we rode that pretty hard, and then when we got off the boat in Nanaimo, we spent the next like five hours riding in varying degrees of pouring rain. So the last day really made its mark on us for weather, but we were staying in the cottage that night, so it was all good. You know, it's just so many things get thrown at you touring, and I like that aspect because a lot of the stuff we do training when you're when you're just at home is you control your environment so much off oh, the weather's not good you you might go on the ergo and and do this or that and uh, or you just wouldn't go out on on a crappy day but when you're torn you just have to go and do it oh there's so much more out there to do than just riding and you know sticking to your 30 30s and your 20 minute thresholds and all this stuff like yeah your bike can take you to some absolutely amazing places that you never ever thought you would go some of these roads like this road from Lytton to little bit in bc it was just like this was like the dream gravel road that i've been wanting to find like the whole tour it was just perfect fairly smooth fast rolling up and down incredible views like only one like massive well, pack of dogs but that was okay um <laughs> you know finished like with this mountain view at sunset uh and this is stuff that happened like like well that was amazing and that was probably the single coolest road we did we have 2400 photos between the three of us your bike racing season is not going to fall apart because you go and explore some stuff well you know that time of the year is always it's always a tricky one because i always find personally the the wheels are falling off just mentally and uh i think my advice to rob was that or something that we we discussed we actually talked about this back at um, canadian nationals and one of the biggest points i have is like okay physically it might not be the best thing like if we're going to talk the sports science aspect it might not be the best best thing to go and do <clears throat> but i think it's so important that at that time of the year mentally you're enjoying what you're doing right and Sometimes it's hard to get that motivation to go and do these intensive blocks of training. And I think it's, yeah, it's one of those things that if you love touring, you like bike packing, you love the freedom and the, what each day is, is kind of like an exciting new adventure, then that's going to be way better in the long run. As far as like you're, if you're looking at performance, just being happy and loving what you're doing and having a challenge each day is going to be way better than kind of like grinding it out at home, like oh, dreading. And you're at a very hard part of the season. You're just hanging on to fumes basically of, uh, you know, what you have left <laughs> in usually September, October is a hard time to, to really keep the motivation high. So, yeah, I think it's one of those things you do have to be cautious, but I always say the mental aspect is going to trump the, the physical aspect. I felt almost refreshed like if by the end of it whereas if i would have done the same volume on a road bike training i would have just been shattered rob Britton is a professional cyclist from regina 2019 will be his fourth year on the u.s pro team rally pro cycling swain tuft rode in the world tour as part of the australian green edge project for the past seven years and he will join Britton on rally for the upcoming season Dan, can you please set a timer? We are going to do our top fives in five minutes. That's two different top fives. I'm going to do Canadian top five moments in cycling for 2018, and you will do? World moments, but but caveat. What's that? I reserved the right to include Canadians in my top five. Oh, I'm intrigued. Okay, uh, tell me when the timer's running, and we'll begin. Timer is a go. Okay, give me one of your top fives. All right. Worlds? Yep. Valverde. Oh. Okay. Hate it or love it. Obviously, a lot of machinations around this man winning. Uh-huh. But you can't deny the emotion that he felt after. And you look back on 2019, you're going to remember that it he won. Sound like a Eurosport thing. Real emotion. Real, real emotion. Uh, but the guy has six world championship medals, including one in Hamilton, Ontario. In 03, I believe. So it's... It's not like he hasn't been consistent. He's been so, so close. Uh-huh. 
and because of everything around him, we're always going to remember this for, for 2019. We're going to remember it all next year. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you one of my top five. Okay. It's a Canadian one. Um, Shelly Goche. She is a, a paracyclist from Toronto. She rides in T1. Uh, that's the, the, the trike category. She got her 14th world championship title this year. And uh, she had a perfect World Cup season. That's winning all the time trials and all the road races. She has just got a phenomenal record. So Yeah, I read your top 10 in the uh, this issue of Canadian Cycling Magazine. <laughs> Shameless plug, no big deal. And... <laughs> It's pretty impressive what she's done. And I think she's even coaching some of the younger generation. I think I saw that. And that's uh, that's cool. Giving back to the community. Yeah. Perfect record. 2019 moment for okay, sure. Okay, yours. All right. Stage 19. Mm-hmm. What am I talking about? The Vuelta a España? No. Oh, sorry. The Giro d'Italia? That's the one. Winner, winner. <laughs> Froome attacks with, attacks with 80k out. That epic solo escape. Takes 40 seconds on Dumoulin. Ultimately holds out. You're taking that your top are, fives. Are, all, like, are my top fives a little spicy? They're a bit. I think you know we're gonna get letters. Weep Conte, if you will. That's Spanish, not Italian. Thank but. you. Um, okay. You know, it was a performance that had everybody talking, had jaws dropping, had uh, somebody making a comparison to Floyd Landis. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a performance. That would be George Bennett. Of that's right. Lotto Yumbo. That's Yellow Lotto. Um, all right, we're gonna remember that for 2019, regardless of what happens in the future. Actually, that's a top five of 2018. Yes. Okay, this one, this is both a trainer moment for me and a moment in real life. <laughs> oh my gosh! Milan San Remo. I watched almost 100 ish kilometers on the trainer. I remember seeing your Strava, thinking, "What happened? <laughs> what happened that he did that?" Yeah. I was watching Milan San Remo. This is the ultimate slow boil. You can't get off because. All the tensions being ramped up and ramped up and ramped up. Stuck on your train. They come off the Chapressa. They come down onto the Poggio. Mm -hmm. Nibli, epic attack. Then the Peloton's within bike lengths of him as he crosses the line. Down on him, yeah. You know, Caleb Ewan comes in second. All it took was Nibli to falter for five, ten seconds. Mm -hmm. Ewan nips him at the line. That was a great performance, and and I remember watching it, going, "Is it gonna? Is this the time? Does it? Does it? Does Will it work? Will this work? Do it? No Will it work? work? It's never worked before. They're not gonna let him. They're not gonna let him <laughs> yeah, yeah. get in with this. It was great drama for sure. But you know, that puts Nibali up in the, the ranks of the all-time greats. He's got Il Lombardia. He's got all three Grand Tours. He's got this monument as well. Top moment of 2019. All right, I'm gonna jump in with some of mine because you've been you've been you've been top fiving. So, um, Megali Rochette. She's had a, a great uh, season in North America. Uh, she's in Europe right now, but in North America, she won the Pan Am Champs. Yep. And then she's once again the Canadian champ. She had just stellar performances here in Ontario. Yes, sir. No argument. And uh, also sticking with Canucks, Corey Wallace. He, uh, the m- marathon mountain biker, got his second straight solo 24-hour world championship. Also recently, he he beat his uh, uh, 24-hour record or sub-24-hour record on the Annapurna circuit. That's the one in Nepal. That's right. No, yeah, Corey Rollis. This guy definitely goes way too under the radar, but he's doing some pretty cool things in 2019. Totally. All right, keeping it on the mountain bike side, Kate Courtney, 23, first win on the elite circuit in the, in the World Cups, and it was her world championship win. Took down Langvad, took down Batty. Mm-hmm. Awesome moment on the dirt side of things. That was totally cool. Also, that segues into my moment, uh, a bunch of moments. Haley Smith, she was sixth in that race, but she was third in the Commonwealth Games. She got bronze there. She's had a phenomenal year. Um, I think we're looking for uh, a lot more stuff from Haley Smith uh, in the next few years. I'm sensing a theme that a lot of your top five moments went in this issue of the magazine. Okay, so the current issue did help me with my thinking of mm-hmm. top five of 2018. It's the December-January issue on Stands Now. So, you know, there was there's a bit of overlap. How much time we got? Two. One. Oh, no. We didn't do five. You know what? I think this calls for overtime. This calls for overtime. <laughs> How many did I just do? I did... I got one. Wait a minute. I think we both have one remaining. Okay, I'm giving us a minute 30 of overtime. (laughs) A minute 30? We don't just get on with it. Stop playing with the phone. Okay, 119 of overtime. Just go. Okay, Woodsy. Woodsy? Ah. Now, which Woodsy moment do you think I'm talking about? Oh, see, because he's on my top five. Um, See, my top five Woodsy moment is I'm going to say Michael Woods and his bronze medal at Worlds. I think... 
now I wrote, wrote about in current issue of the magazine. I wrote about both of his big um, moments of, of this year. And I think worlds is one is more uh, personal in mm-hmm. a way. It's got a personal narrative. That's just so strong. And the other, I think speaks to Canadian cycling a bit more uh, as a whole. Um, Woods is uh, third in uh, Innsbruck. It had, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, yeah. especially Kevin Field of Cycling Canada, um, who I like to call Mr. Moneyball of Canadian uh, Cycling. There's just, there's so much going you know, on I in the I love the story about him and Duchenne working together to really nail that descent. Because I got to be honest, when I, saw him, when I saw them going over the top with Bardet, with uh, Valverde, I was like, all right, no way Woodsy's holding on to this. But... Looks like all that homework they did together with Duchenne just kind of drop him constantly on the descent. Obviously paid off. He knew that descent like the back of his hand. Yeah, there was there was a lot of work, a lot of prep that went into that. And I think all that homework paid off uh, on all sorts of levels from, yeah, uh, it was a team effort. And Woods Woods's, um result is it, it, it that's what the work produced. So mm. I think that is at my top. That's the top moment for me. Okay, so my Woods moment. <laughs> you know, it's a Woods moment. My Woods moment. Liège. What? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> no, it's the Vuelta win. That's uh, what I thought you were going to say. No, <laughs> oh, Liège was good. No, no, no. It was the Vuelta win. Yes. Um, I think for me, ultimately getting it done on the world tour is a big step for Woods. Yeah. Of course, the famous quote of do it for your family. Like, I'm literally getting chills right now just thinking of it and the room's not that cold. Um, like that's such an emotional moment. It resonates with people beyond being pro cycling fans. Like it's such a yeah, human touching. Yeah, there's such a moment. not a relatable moment, but it's everyone's been touched by tragedy, and to see him use that to achieve something he's always dreamed of was great. Yeah, and that line is it was um, uh, thought up by his um, director uh, Juan Magarate, and it was like it was it for me. What I liked about that story is it was such a he knew Michael's Michael Woods's condition so well, his, his sort of psychology. He was able to use it in a in a in a, a meaningful way that that yeah helped Woods take that stage. Yeah, that's uh, and then you just had a string of second places and close calls, and to finally see him win, um, I think that just proves to him that he's at the level that he needs to win at the World Tour mm-hmm. and. Moving into the Ardennes Classics, I think that gives him a lot of confidence going yeah. into next year. Yeah, that 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 will be exciting to watch. Okay, and here's the bad news. What's that? Uh, when I put it to a minute thirty, um, I actually set it to an hour thirty. So our overtime is going to be either our very, overtime is going to be really very epic, long, right. or we should just close this off. I think <laughs> there's our top fives of yeah. 2018. All right, we're looking forward to 2019. We're going to start a new segment on the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast called Ask a Coach. The coach taking our questions is Peter Glassford. He's a contributor to the magazine and the website. Peter coaches many riders who I've raced against in master's races, or at least I used to race against them, as they all seem to have moved up in in categories throughout the past few years. I also love to watch Peter race cyclocross because he's sure to throw a wicked tail whip during competition. My question for Peter is how to navigate the holiday season in a way that doesn't set my fitness back too much when I get back to regular training in January. Let's hear what Peter has to say. Peter Glassford, welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. Excited to be here, Matt. Right on. So you are our coach and we are going to ask you questions and well, here's my question for you. Um, it's it, we we are in the thick of the holiday season. Um, I'm, I'm sort of struggling to, to get all the gifts on my list for people. Um, I'm trying to wrap up work before, you know, everything shuts down and, um, but it's, you know, I don't want my fitness to, to, to totally tank over the holidays where, you know, I'm going to have a turkey and some pie and all kinds of stuff. And I think this is something a lot of cyclists, um, are, going to be thinking about either right now or in the next few days what what strategies might you have for you know not necessarily 
winning at uh, at Zwift or anything, but not uh, returning after the holidays, being um, behind the eight ball in in terms of physical fitness. Yeah, it's a very common question and, and, and issue, right? We have this block of time, you know, and probably everyone's been in that situation for, you know, all of December. It's crazy with holiday parties and, and different things. It's just a hectic time of year. Uh, so what I'll usually have people doing is, you know, number one, talking to the family and just sort of, you know, these are my goals, you know, this is what I'd like to do. Where does this fit in? You know, what are, what are my windows, right? That seems to be a common term that comes up with clients is I have this window to ride. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, I have an hour to ride on these days. And so that, that can be helpful in itself. You'd be surprised how often just that, that step of talking to the family and working through what's available and what's, you know, reasonable, we could call it compromise that, that often is a big, a big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think for cyclists, especially the ones who are really into the smart trainers and, you know, suffering and so forth indoors, um, I think this this time of year is, is used to be we used to call this like base one or, you know, general preparation. We used to be outside skiing and stuff like that. Um, so I think, you know, do what, you know, your two trainer rides a week or whatever you can do during that week, whatever you have planned during that week. Uh, and then just get out. Right. That could be, you know, my family plays a bit of road hockey or something like that. You know, go for walks with your family. Um, a really nice thing I try and do personally is like I'll do my trainer ride. And then we'll go walk to town or go, again, family walk or whatever uh, right after. And so then you're getting sort of a element of endurance into that, right? You're continuing to move for an extended period. Uh, so that can be really helpful too, just sort of stacking stuff a little bit up. Um, and then you mentioned your turkey and stuff. Um, the one concept I like, I, I dared, I don't really want to call it a diet, but... Uh, the worth it diet is something one of my friends uh, actually came up with and it was sort of just his general nutrition strategy and he just asked himself if if this was worth it. Um, so I think on Thanksgiving, you know, there's like the white bun that's on every table, right? It's just like miscellaneous bun, you know, from the like, you know, discount, whatever, unless your family has really good like homemade buns, then that might be worth it. Um, but there's that, there's the stuffing, there's, you know, desserts, there's wine, there's, you know, whatever. And it's, I think sometimes we just have to sort of step back and, and this could be a pre-plan, you know, you know, the stuffing's going to be there and it's the best stuffing all year. Don't not have the stuffing if that's like a big thing for you, but you know, if you can pull out the white bun you don't even like, but someone's just passing to you, um, you know, those can be little wins that actually do add up fairly substantially. I never thought of that because I don't know, maybe I was, I was trained by my grandmother to, you know, just eat everything on my plate and, and my grandmother would quickly put everything on my plate, but yeah, to, right. to be a bit more selective about what you're, what you're, you're putting there and yeah, is it worth it? Do I really want this or am I just reaching for the bun because there's, there's these dinner rolls on the table. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's such an odd, you're right. There's a lot of different, you know, f family based, you know, norms or, you know, even there's things that we think we're expected to do. And A, it, it probably doesn't matter as much as you think it does that you finish your plate. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also at the point, you know, we're all at the point in our lives where, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal to just uh, not have something right. But again, you don't want to go through necessarily a lot of us would really struggle if we were just like, I'm not having grandma stuffing or that pumpkin pie. But just being a little bit more selective, right? Like, what is that thing for you? Like, I personally, I'd rather drink a bunch of scotch and, you know, away we go. So I don't generally have a lot in the way of desserts or stuffing mm. or, or buns. And, um, you know, we can judge that one way or the other. Uh, but that's sort of my, oh, it's the holidays. I'll have, you know, that nice glass of scotch or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to each their own. Right. No. And it's, it's, it's not heavy planning, but it's something you can sort of plan in advance and just have that as a strategy. I just wanted to go back to that idea of like combining a ride with a walk. Is that a way to like get, uh, just sneak in endurance or how does that work? Is it because you've just, your, your body's still moving throughout the day? Yeah, I mean, I like to, there's a couple things like, so my wife and I run a podcast called The Consummate Athlete. And so a big inspiration for that was just this idea of, you know, we could be more well-rounded athletes um, and potentially for quote unquote normal people, this would actually open up more work capacity 
because we're traveling for business or, you know, we have to take our kids to baseball or, you know, whatever, we're on a ski trip. There's all these barriers. There's weather in Canada. Um, so to me, again, there is specificity. I'm not denying that that's important, but there is the reality that if I can do a 5k run, um, this is a very triathlete example, but after, you know, completing say a mountain bike race or a cyclocross race, I have the work capacity that I could continue and go for a run or go walk or go, you know, I always think about the kids at the, the races. You've probably seen them even at cyclocross races, they race their race. And then 10 minutes later, they have a hand, like they've just chugged a chocolate milk and then they're dirt jumping and they're running around building jumps or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they're doing. They're in the trials thing, doing tricks and stuff. Um, and it's just that like never ending energy, right? That ability to keep moving and that, yeah, for sure. It's if you can go and walk for an hour after you do your trainer ride, you, it, 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 that's just work capacity, right? Right. Um, and, and I think there's some dietary things too. Like I think you could, you know, do different things with fueling around that as well to maybe augment that. Um, but yeah, for sure. How do you mean uh, augment your fueling? What I would do in that case, like it would depend on the workout that led into it. But I mean, if, if you didn't necessarily have that post-workout full meal um, before you went for the walk in the same way that you would not maybe, you know, if you're out on a two hour ride, you would only consume so much. Um, I, I feel like then you're going to also be sort of like depleted and then you're also walking. So that walking may actually feel a little harder. And again, you can get as kooky as you want with that. But I think, you know, you're just, you're continuing to walk. So again, you're working aerobically after maybe a harder trainer session or just maybe an easier trainer session. Peter, these are, these are some great tips. Thank you very much. I think they will, will definitely help me and uh, our listeners as uh, we get deeper and deeper into the holidays. Awesome, Matt. Have a great holiday. You too. Thanks. Bye. Peter Glassford is a professional coach and head of Smart Athlete Coaching Services. You can listen to more training advice on The Consummate Athlete, a podcast by Peter and his wife, Molly Herford. Send your Ask a Coach questions for Peter to podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. In early October, Melanie Chambers, a regular contributor at Canadian Cycling Magazine, received an email saying she got an entry into the Taiwan KOM Challenge. It's a 105-kilometer race open to riders of various abilities, including pros. In 2018, Emma Pooley and Lawrence Tandam competed in the challenge. The route goes from close to sea level to 3,275 meters. One part in the last 10 kilometers has grades a little more than 27%. Melanie accepted the invitation. They had a challenge for her, not that she needed one, was that the invite was last minute. The Toronto-based writer and rider only had about three weeks to get ready for the event. Here's the story of Melanie's Taiwan KOM challenge and her effort to make the six and a half hour time cutoff to earn a finisher's medal. It's the morning before the KOM. I'm here in my hotel room getting ready for a, a light ride. It's going to be the hardest race I've ever done in my life with minimal training. And my goal is to just finish this thing. I've got six and a half hours to ride 85 kilometers all uphill. I've been surrounded by a bunch of amazing professional athletes who have done this before, giving me tips on how to just keep going. The second half is supposed to be a lot harder. The last 10K, in fact, is brutal. 27.3% grade in some sections. But I'm, I'm less nervous than when I first arrived. It, it was the unknown. We're here with a media group, and there's definitely two camps of people. There's the journalists that are riding, and then there's the professional athletes. So just being surrounded by like-minded people who are just as scared as I am, about the pain. I guess that's what scares me the most, is just um, enduring the pain uh, and, and mentally just forcing myself to get over it and finish. What's actually really inspirational for me is being around the professional athletes. People that have done this before, uh, Haley Simmons is a British writer, 
who came in second last year, and she was telling me about her season this year. She fell on her elbow, uh, had stitches, and then fell again and reopened it. She's got a metal pins and wire in her arm. Lucy Kenny, who is a contender for first place in the women's category. Uh, she had an accident this year. It's uh, She broke her eye socket, her jaw. She had a concussion. She came back, she was feeling strong and she had another accident and it just set her back all over again. She said the second was um, mentally that much harder than the first. It's, uh, yeah, it, they're professional athletes. This is their life. This is their, their reason for being and their dedication is, uh, is very inspirational. If I can just absorb, rub a little bit of that on me as I'm going up the hill. The other part of it, of being here, I mean, I was just petrified before I came. I wasn't sleeping. I would wake up and my heart rate was just going through the roof. But what is really inspiring is hearing from people that know me, telling me that I was made to do this, um, telling me that just do what you love. And it is, I, I just love riding my bike and have fun, just enjoy this. I, um, I lost my mom a year ago and her death has made my life more vivid. Everything I'm doing lately, I, I think of soaking everything out of the moment of my life and um, I just hear her all the time. She was just so proud of me. Um, so I'm gonna put a picture of her on my top tube as well. The other thing I'm gonna put on my top tube is a quote that I send myself sometimes in an email when I'm feeling down and the quote is, you're fucking Melanie Chambers. Just remember who you are. Remember what you love, what you're doing. Uh, and a quote from my partner's mom, who's a huge fan, she said um, that I'm an inspiration to her. You have the power, the empathy, the wisdom, and the common sense of a super woman. Uh, wow, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that just gets me. And I just have to remind myself of that. This is all mental at this point. There's nothing more I can do physically just to, to get over this, the pain, to finish, and to think of the feeling after, because that's always the best. It's when you finished and you've reached the top. I love that feeling. I just keep thinking of that as I'm going through the race. And another uh, bit of advice from Annabelle Rhinus is to sing up the mountain. So I've got to think of a good song to get in my head. At the start line, we've got about uh, half an hour to go. The waiting is killing me. It's uh, a full moon. You can still see the moon. It's pretty sweet. And the mountains are absolutely crystal clear. I am so out of my league. Uh, I had to ask somebody how to put a chip on to my fork. <laughs> You must have thought I was crazy. Um, yeah, I just want to get started. Just, um, you can feel it in the air. People are just kind of uh, in their own space and lots of selfies. Okay, <laughs> I'm 23 kilometers in. We just passed the um, warm-up section. I'm feeling good. I was talking to a guy that was, uh, held my bike when I went to pee. So we chatted for a bit in the warm-up and uh, it's taken down the nerves. We're going through the Taroko Gorge. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'm biking beside some awesome people. Hey! <laughs> Um, uh, I feel really good to be alive. 
and I just keep looking at my mom. Fuck. Uh, okay. Just one long bike ride now. What's your name? My name is Jean. And your what kind of wine do you have in your water bottle? You're a type, the type of wine. <laughs> no. It's, uh, no, it's not in your water bottle. Chateau Chateau Mouton Rothschild. Chateau Mouton Rothschild is for the next, the last 20 kilometers. For the last 10? Yeah. For the last 10? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm just going through a tunnel right now. There's a lot of tunnels that cut through the mountains. And, uh... It's deceiving because it's four and a half percent grade. I'm going about 20 clicks an hour. Feels good. I'm almost at the 40 kilometer mark, so conceivably halfway. But the suffering is going to start really soon. So I just have to think of right now. One pedal stroke at a time. Kilometer 42 and a half. It's starting to get serious. I made a mistake with the last one. We're not at half. Oh, yeah. I'm looking over into the gorge and it's winding up. My heart rate's starting to go up a bit more. Yeah, my legs, definitely feeling, just gotta keep eating. Kilometer 55. I just passed the first water station, stopped a refill. I got 50 kilometers left. I'm just under three hours. It's gonna be tight to get in, under six and a half. Oh, my hamstring's got this weird tinge going on. But I'm feeling good. I can do this. Over and out. Okay. I am at 58 kilometers. Three hours. Uh, 2.5% grade. I've got about 40 minutes shaved off that, so I've got four and a half hours. Okay. I'm in a tunnel at 64.5. Uh, 3.35. I've been on the bike. 8% grade. Oh God, it's hurting, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just feel like I'm run over. Okay, this is where the mental kicks in. I am fucking Melanie Chambers. I am fucking Melanie Chambers. I can do this. Okay, 68.7. And time, three hours, 54 minutes. Going down a little bit, catch my breath. Got a little surge of energy there a second ago. Uh, feeling much better. I think it might have been just uh, some gels, caffeine. Caffeine gels just sunk in. Fuck, it's beautiful. It's just, it's like Jurassic Park. It's, uh, Right now, just perfect temperature. You can feel it. it's getting cool. I'm about 10, 10 kilometers from the 2,000 meter mark. And uh, yeah, and then from there, the hell begins. Woo! I'm sore. Uh, that little twinge in the side of my IT band is there. Uh, my shoulders. Uh, 
my traps. Just gotta relax. Uh, okay, this is a nice little 3.4 humming along. All right, time to switch gears. All right, my legs are just bled. Uh, I'm at 92. Uh, just past a feeding station at Banana. Oh, the weather is just unbelievable. It's cool. Now we're up into a pine forest. You can smell the needles. Oh, it just it just just changed. Oh, it smells so good. Oh. Yeah, this is what it's about. <laughs> I feel really good. All right, I just finished the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. The last 15 kilometers, um, my legs were seizing up. I was walking. Uh, uh, and I finished two minutes before the cutoff. I've been home a week. Uh, it's a week ago I was in Taiwan, finished the race, and uh, now I'm set back into normal life. And I've had a little time to reflect on my experience, what it meant to finish two minutes under the cutoff. Um, and I think, really, it's just, it's like having a secret that every time you think of, it makes you feel stronger and better something that you did that you hold inside you I know that might sound kind of cheesy or airy fairy but that race meant a lot to me uh, made me feel alive it made me feel alive in a way that I, I want the next adventure you know it's only been a week and I'm thinking oh, well, what next what new challenge can I tackle? And um, that spills over in a real life. You think, if I could do that on a bike for six and a half hours uh, with so little training, what else can I do? Um, it just kind of makes you feel invincible, stronger. Um, you feel special too when you tell people about it. They're just so amazed. And then you just feed off that amazement. And... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not saving the planet by any means, but it's just, it's a, it's a personal victory. And it really just feels good. Melanie Chambers is a regular contributor to Canadian Cycling Magazine, and she's based in Toronto. And there you have it, the last episode of 2018 of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. It was put together by Dan Walker, me, Matthew Pioro, Philippe Tremblay, and it was produced by Adam Killick. Now, if you want more, check us out at cyclingmagazine.ca and subscribe to the magazine. Or we're on Instagram at Canadian Cycling. We're on Twitter at Canadian Cycling as well. And on Facebook, it's Cycling Mag. We are on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and what I normally call Intune, but it's actually Tune In. That's right. So all of those Amazon podcast people, now you know where to find it. All right. Now, we're going to be going back to full send, no send in the next year. So we want to hear your full send, no send ideas. Email the editor at podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. Also, if you want to ask a coach and have a question for Peter Glassford, you can send that into the same address, podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca. Or we'll be both in the same email. Yeah. We're not we're not picky. Oh no, we can we can parse it. We'll read the whole email. Now, what you can do to help is you can rate and review, but only if it's five stars and And please say something nice. Yes. Over the holidays, if you see Saint Nick creeping down your chimney, 
or a grumpy man in green, the Grinch. Grinch. <laughs> Tell him to download and listen. Yeah, yeah. Recommend our podcast, will you? Thanks. Merry ho hos to that. And as always, we thank the Ontario Media Development Corporation for its support. Thanks for listening, and see you next year. Thanks.